Open up your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 6, 2 Samuel chapter 6. We've been dealing with being a person after God's own heart like David was. And the first sermon was on David's attitude towards battle. Is this too loud? No? Okay, all right. Well, the first sermon was on David's attitude towards battle, never give up because God is on your side, always fight in the name of the Lord and so on. The second sermon was David's attitude towards others, never seek revenge, always let God judge, uh, be humble. And then, of course, last week we learned David's attitude towards authority, always let God judge your authority, honor and protect your authority and submit to them. This week is going to be the final sermon in the series. It's David's attitude towards God. Now, remember that David was called a man after God's own heart heart. Now, David's attitude towards authority and people and battle and those things are important, but they are not God's heart in a sense because they are a man relating to other people. But when we relate to God, that is when we step into that our heart becomes like God's heart because we are loving him. And you love God in the same way he loves us as opposed to loving other people. And we relate to God differently than we do other people. And so this is the most important of the series because it shows us how David's attitude towards God can teach us how our attitude toward God should be. Now, when I started preparing this, I had a list of probably 10 or 15 different, uh, different stories in, in the Samuels and the, and the Kings and the Chronicles uh, to try to explain, you know, what, what was David's attitude towards God. And I ended up with just three, and they all come from the story found in 2 Samuel chapter 6. We're going to get into um, 1 Chronicles as well but it's a repeat of the same story just told from a slightly different viewpoint. So if you want, you can stick your finger in 1 Chronicles chapter 15. We'll be going there in a little bit, but we'll also be back in 2 Samuel chapter 6. So let's start with reading 2 Samuel chapter 6, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read out of the New Living. Do I have that verse up there? I don't. There we go. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1. Then David mobilized 30,000 special troops. He led them to Baalah of Judah to bring home the Ark of God, which bears the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim. They placed the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the hillside home of Abinadab. Uh, Uzziah and ah Ahio, I always want to say Ohio, but <laughs> Ahio, Abinadab's sons, were guiding the cart with the Ark of God on it and Ahio walking in front. David and all the peoples of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all their might, singing songs and playing all kinds of musical instruments, lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. Sounds like a great party, doesn't it? I mean, this, if you're gonna, if you're gonna bring God's presence to a place, that's the way to do it, with all kinds of shouts and singing and joyous worship and cymbals and all that kind of stuff. Look in verse six. But when they arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled, and Uzziah put out his hand to steady the ark of God. Then the Lord's anger blazed out against Uzziah for doing this, and God struck him dead beside the, uh, the ark of God. David was angry because the Lord's anger had blazed out against Uzziah, and he named that place Perez Uzzah, which means outbreak against Uzzah. It is still called that today. Verse, verse 9, David was now afraid of the Lord and asked, how can I ever bring the ark of the Lord back into my care? So David decided not to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David. He took it instead to the, the home of Obed-Edom of Gath. The ark of the Lord remained there with the family of Obed-Edom for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Go to verse 12. Then the King David was told, the Lord has blessed Odeb-Edom's uh, Odeb home and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went there and brought the ark of the ark to the city of David with great celebration. After the men who were carrying it had gone six steps, they stopped and waited so David could sacrifice an ox and a fattened calf. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing a priestly tunic. So David and all of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with much shouting and blowing of trumpets. The first thing we learn about David and his attitude towards God, well, it's not going to be up there, is that David wanted God's presence with him where he was. Now, if you're not familiar with the story of David, after he became king, he took Jerusalem, which didn't belong to the Israelites until David's time. And it was up on a hill. It was. It still is <laughs> up on a hill. 
and, uh, and it's, it's all craggy, it's difficult to get to, the walls were really high, and the people of Jerusalem told you know, David, he said, you can't take this city, and he took the city anyway, and it was such a great stronghold, and it was such a victory that he decided to move the capital of Israel, uh, which would have been Judah and Israel at the time, they weren't divided yet, it, into Jerusalem. Also, if you look at a map of Israel and Judah, about like this, Jerusalem's kind of right in the middle. So it helped, because then when people were all traveling f to the Ark of the, uh, to the Ark of the Covenant, to um, celebrate Passover and stuff like that. They could meet in the middle instead of the people in the north having to travel all the way down to the south. So this city of David did not have the Ark of the Lord or even a tabernacle or a temple or nothing by the time David took it. So he builds a, t or a tabernacle there, just like the one that they had before, which was all in tatters. And he says, I'm going to bring the Ark of God all the way up to Jerusalem. The Ark of the Lord had been captured by the Philistines and they had taken it uh, when, um, I believe it was in the battle when Saul was killed. So they've had it, and finally they said, we can't take it anymore. All their gods were falling down, they were all getting sick, and so they took it to this town and said, here, you keep the ark, we don't want anything to do with it. And that's where it was. And David said, it doesn't belong there, it belongs with me. David wanted God's presence with him at all times. Now we can ask the question, Why? Why does David want the Ark of the, the Ark of the Covenant with him? And it'd be easy to say, well, he wants it because it blesses people. Obviously, it blesses Obed Edom. And he's like, well, I want that. Well, that's probably a legitimate reason. But I think it goes beyond that. If we look at Psalm chapter 42, verses 1 and 2, As the deer pants for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I come and stand before him? David's desire for the Lord wasn't just about blessings, it was about relationship. In uh, uh, Psalm 16, verse 11, David says, You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. David took pleasure in living with God. One more. Psalm 31, verse 20. You hide them in the shelter of your presence, safe from those who conspire against them. You shelter them in your presence, far from accusing tongues. David knew that not only did God's presence bring blessing and protection, but there was a pleasure in having God's presence with him. Now we, in the New Testament church, especially out here in the Midwest, we just assume the presence of God. Where two or more are gathered, God is there with us, so God is here. How about this one? God lives inside of us, so he's always with me everywhere I go. And those are both true. But how much time do we spend seeking out the presence of God? We have gotten into the habit of assuming that the presence of God is here, and so we don't go get it. Well, God's presence is in my spirit, so why do I need to, to go out and search for him? Well, the presence of God was with David, too, and he still panted after him like a deer pants for water. How thirsty are we for worshiping God in his inner chamber? Do we desire in our heart of hearts to connect with our creator? Or are we interested in what he can give us? how he can protect us. Maybe we're just interested in heaven. We're not interested in dealing with him on earth because, you know, we're busy down here. I'll have plenty of time to worship God when I get to heaven. You know, we make excuses. And we try to explain away and reason away our lack of desire for God. But in the end, a lack of desire for God means you've replaced God with something else. You know what that's called? Idolatry. When you love something more than God, that's called idolatry. When you've decided, I know that I should be spending time with God in prayer. I know that I should be spending time with God in worship. I know that I should be spending time with God in a church service or whatever it is. But you decide, no, I really want to do this other thing better. Or I don't feel like it today. Or I'm just not feeling it. You know, today I, I, I sat down, I started praying, and I just wasn't feeling anything. So I decided to quit and try again later. Do we put effort into being in the presence of God. How much effort did David put into being in the presence of God? Well, the first time he tried, he went down with, how many was it? Wasn't it like 30,000 people? Yeah, 30,000 special troops. These are the Marines. <laughs> 
He didn't just go get the army. No offense to anyone in the army, but, you know, he went down and got the special forces and said, hey, we're going to go bring the ark up. I need 30,000 of you. The ark was about this big, okay? Two guys could carry it. Be kind of heavy. He's supposed to have more than that, but two guys could carry it, okay? And he's got 30,000 men. Why? Because he wanted to put forth the effort necessary for bringing God's presence to him. Notice he didn't just go to where the ark was in worship. He wanted God's presence with him all the time. You know, sometimes we say, well, I'll spend time in God's presence on Sunday morning when I come to worship. And that's good. You should be in God's presence when we come together to worship. But if you wait, in, excuse me, if you wait until now, it won't happen. Or at least it won't happen very well. But if all week you are spending time in God's presence and then you come into the presence of the Lord here at church, it'll be far more powerful and you will receive more out of it. Lesson number one, we need to desire and pursue God's presence always. Never be satisfied with where you are with the Lord. Never be satisfied with the depth of relationship that you have with God. Always desire more. Why? Because God desires more from you. He wants you. He wants to relate to you. He wants to, to be with you. Is it getting dark? <laughs> Can you guys not see it okay? Okay. Is it still coming out okay on the camera? Okay, all right. I want to show you something else here. Look down at verse, uh, verse 12. Then King David was told, the Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's home and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went there and brought the ark to the city of David with great celebration. You know, David didn't shy away from the fact that God's ark brought blessing. And you know, we receive blessing when we spend time with God. Now, the, the Bible here is talking about material blessing specifically, but it doesn't, you know, we receive a lot more than that and even more important things than that. When we spend time with God, we receive blessings like peace strength, focus, direction, encouragement, and even purpose. We get what we need from God when we spend time with God. But if we just throw him a prayer as we're going to work in the morning, but thanks for stuff, God, and here's a couple things I need, I'll see you tomorrow. Is that going to honor the Lord? Is that spending time in His presence? No, we need to seek out, to put forth the effort, to try to spend time in God's presence the way David did. Uh, I know that this is in Hebrew, but the word that comes to mind is the Greek word dioko. It's used to uh, for persecute in the New Testament, but it also means to pursue with intent to capture. You guys have heard me talk about that word before. We need to dioko the Lord. We need to pursue Him. And when it feels like he's eluding us, we need to chase after him. <laughs> I just got a funny image in my head. Uh, don't raise your hands, but is any female, you'll think about this, females, have you ever done this before where the guy, you know, is interested in you and you kind of play hard to get a little bit, make him work for it? Yeah. I could just see God doing that. So you want to spend time with me? Take another step. It's a little step, but go ahead and take another step. Now, he's not doing that for his own benefit. He's not playing hard to get. He's trying to get you to grow, okay? Because spending time in God's presence blesses us more than it blesses him. But we need to be seeking after it, striving for it, pursuing it. Go to 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter 15. Now, this, if you're not familiar with this, the, the uh, Chronicles carries with it a lot of the same stories that the, that the kings do. They tell the same period of time. They're just, uh, these were the official chronicles of the king, whereas Samuel was written by, we're not sure who 2 Samuel was written by. 1 Samuel was probably written by Samuel, but then he dies and probably didn't write 2 Samuel since he was dead. Okay. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 15, this tells the same story. It tells the second half of the story. So David's already tried to bring the ark. Uzziah was killed. Go to verse 1 of chapter 15. It says, David now built several buildings for himself in the city of David. He also prepared a place for the ark of God, that's the new tabernacle, and set it up in a, or set up a special tent there to shelter it. Then he issued these instructions. When we transport the ark of God this time, no one except the Levites may carry it. The Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister before him forever. Why did Uzziah get killed? Because he wasn't a Levite. 
He had no right to touch the ark of God. No right whatsoever. In fact, the Bible says if you look at the Old Testament, if you touch the ark, you die. Well, he touched the ark, so he died. In fact, what we found, they, they took the ark and stuck it on a cart. It was a new cart. That's kind of fancy, you know. But it was a cart. You're not supposed to carry the ark of God on a cart. You're supposed to stick two poles of acacia wood through the rings on the side and carry it with uh, one Levite on each end of each pole. And there's a good reason for that. It won't fall off the cart. <laughs> you won't have that problem if you're carrying it on poles. Okay? So what David did is he finally went back and figured out how you're supposed to bring the Ark of the Covenant to places. And then skip down to verse 11. It says, Then David summoned the priests. There's a whole bunch of people there I'm not going to read. Verse 12. He said to them, You are the leaders of the Levite families. You must purify yourselves and all your fellow Levites so you can bring the Ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place I have prepared for it. Because you Levites did not carry the Ark the first time, the anger of the Lord burst out against us. We failed to ask God how to move it in the proper way. So the priests and Levites purified themselves in order to bring the Ark of the Lord the God of Israel to Jerusalem. Then the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with its carrying poles, just as the Lord had instructed Moses. So we see here that David finally did his research. He finally got out the dusty old Bible and looked it up how he's supposed to carry the ark of God. The second lesson here is never treat time with God as a common thing. Always do it right. Never treat time with God as a common thing. What is time with God? Technically, God is with you all the time, but we spend dedicated time with the Lord when we, for example, read our Bibles, spend time in prayer. Uh, anytime we go to a, a, a congregate service where we worship with others, uh, some people spend time in worship with music, some people just spend it in prayer. Uh, Bible studies, whatever it is, anytime you're going to spend time with the Lord, never treat it as a common thing. Now, what does that mean? That means take it or leave it. That's good, you know, but how important is it really? We get up in the morning. The I mean, I tell you guys, I'm, I'm the worst. I hate mornings. I am not a morning person. Oddly enough, I'm not a night person either. <laughs> I'm like a mid-afternoon person. <laughs> uh, and, you know, when I get up in the morning, get the kids off to school and, and come here to the church, the last thing I want to do is spend time in God's presence because I'm cranky. I don't want to read my Bible. I don't want to spend time in worship. I just feel like grumbling. I'll go do something mindless for a while until I wake up. You know what I've, what I've found? By putting off time with God, I end up not doing it at all. And that's bad. I need to be spending time in God's presence every day especially if I'm to lead other people. I don't do that anymore, you know, giving it up, because I've learned that if I don't do it right away, it doesn't happen. Many of you probably found the same thing in your lives. When we treat it as a no big deal, as a take it or leave it, we cheapen our relationship with God. We need to do it, and we need to do it right. Let me say that again. We need to do it, and we need to do it Right. Now, let me clarify here. Anytime you're talking about worship and you say, we need to do it right, the first thing that pops into most people's heads is form. We need to do it right. We need to sing the right songs. We need to have the right order. We need to make sure we do this in this time and this place and we do it this way with these people. But that's not what it means in the New Covenant. Now, in the Old Covenant, it was form. Uh, when Aaron's sons brought strange fire to the tabernacle or to the, to the altar, what happened? They got killed because they brought the wrong fire. Uh, when, you know, uh, Uzziah, uh, caught the ark, what happened? He got killed because he did it wrong physically. But remember, the new covenant is an internalization of the old covenant. That's what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said, don't murder. I say, don't hate. Internal. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I say, don't lust. Internal. He took the law and internalized it, and it works the same here. It's not as much what we do externally as much it is as it is what we do internally. And I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again and again and again until everyone gets it. Worship happens inside. It doesn't happen out here. You could do whatever you want out here and not be worshiping. I've seen people do it. Oh, they get all excited. 
And they're jumping around and they're shouting and hooping and hollering and having a grand old time, but I know they're not worshiping because it's not in here. Because they don't walk away changed. They don't walk away better. They walk away exactly the same. You don't get to enter God's presence and walk out the same. It doesn't work that way. It's kind of like entering a car wash and coming out the other side still dirty. Like, what happened? You went through the wrong car wash, I guess. That was just somebody's garage. Because if you enter God's presence, you will walk away changed. <laughs> I don't think it was that funny. So what does it mean to worship God in the right way in our new covenant? I'm going to give you three things, and I think they're up here. First of all, approach God with humility. You have to approach God with humility, and that has to be first, because the Bible says that he uh, resists the proud. If you try to come into God's presence with pride in your heart, you'll find a brass wall between the two of you. And he'll say, you can't come into my presence with pride because you can't come into my presence with that kind of sin. Now, the real technical reason why you can't is because we can't truly worship when we have pride in our heart, because worship is an act of submission. So that's really what's going on. It's not like God saying, no, no sin. You cannot enter my presence with sin. The truth is you can't because you won't. All right? Because it's they are opposites of each other. So first of all, approach God with humility. Secondly, approach him with desire. This one can be really tough early in the morning. <laughs> because being in the presence of the Lord isn't always comfortable. Sometimes it's convicting. Sometimes it's challenging. And when we're tired or stressed or upset, what do we want to do? I, want to, I just want to sit and watch TV. I just want to go hang out with my friends. I just want to find some donuts. You want to do that, donuts? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The other day I was walking home and I kept smelling donuts. I don't know where. I think it was on my face because it was like followed me for like eight blocks. I'm like, where are the donuts? Uh, I didn't get any because it was last night and I can't eat sugar before Sunday. But... Uh, you know, we need to approach God with desire. We need to desire Him. Um, don't raise your hand, guys, because I don't want you to embarrass yourself, but think about this. Have you ever had a sympathy date where you ask a girl out and she says yes and you find out later she just felt sorry for you? How good does that make you feel? <laughs> Is that fun? Is that, is that exciting? When we come to the Lord and say, you know, God, I don't really want to be here, but I know I'm supposed to. How does that make him feel? Say, well, Micah, you can't hurt God's feelings. Really? What does the Bible say about grieving the spirit? That sounds like hurting his feelings. God has feelings. You're created in his image. You have them too. Yours can get hurt. So can his. And when you come to him and say, you know, guys, yeah, forget it, forget it and walk off. It rejects him. Now, he's a big guy. He can take it. He's not going to strike you with a lightning bolt. He's got grace, but doesn't feel good. We need to approach God with desire. The last one is we need to approach him with expectation. I think this is the hardest, personally. It is for me, at least. Approaching God with expectation, saying, I am going to come into your presence. I am going to succeed in getting into your presence. And while I'm there, I am going to be changed. You guys remember a while ago, I had you hold up your Bibles and say, this is my Bible. I believe it from cover to cover. Um, I, it, I have what it says I have. I can be what it says I can be, and I can do what it says I can do. And then at the end, I said, we're going to read the Word of God, and I will never, ever, ever be the same. That's expectation. When you come into the presence of God, theoretically, you'll never, ever, ever be the same. But we don't do that. We come into the presence of God more out of obligation than anything and say, God, I'm here. I love you. Time to eat. And then we go home. We don't have an expectation that we're not going to be the same. How many of you, you can raise your hand on this. Did any, can anyone honestly say that you expected to be changed when you came to church this Sunday? Anybody willing to admit that? Nobody? That you generally expected to be changed this morning. Maybe you just don't want to raise your hand so you don't want to be singled out. Most of us don't. Most of us come on Sunday mornings because we've been doing it for 50 years. I can't not come to church. i got to go to church. I'm not sick. Everything's okay. i got to make it to church because that's what you do. But you don't come expecting to be changed. When we come into the presence of the Lord, we should always have expectations. Now, we need to be careful about those expectations. We need to make sure that we expect whatever God will give us not something in particular, 
But we need to always have expectations that we will walk away different than when we came in. And the same goes for your quiet time in the morning. I love it when Harold gets up and says, you know, I was reading God's word and this, this, you know, really popped out to me. Because when he's sitting there reading, he's receiving from the Lord. He's being changed. Now, I don't know if he sits down and expects to be changed. But every time I sit down at my computer, because I don't have a paper Bible, and I look at my screen, I say, God, I'm about to read your word. Please change me while I do this. Whatever needs to be changed, change me. And when I have that expectation, I will usually receive at least something. It's not always something grand, but I usually re receive something. How many of us come before the Lord with no expectation whatsoever? Now, why is that important? Because that's like telling God, I really don't think you're going to do anything while I'm there. You know, I know I love you, but maybe you don't love me as much. Or maybe you're not strong enough to change me. Or maybe you just don't care as much. That's what you tell God when you do that. You may think you're being homeless saying, God, I just take whatever you want. I don't have any expectations because I won't put any pressure on you. Pressure on God, really? <laughs> I think he can take it. He wants to change you when you meet. Never treat time with God as a common thing. Now again, I want to point this out. This is internal. When we come together and worship God, we need to have humility, desire, and expectations. It has nothing to do with what you're doing on the outside. Let me give you an example. Um, we were, Kara and I were at Liberty, and Kara's a, she's a, a, an expressive worshiper. She loves to worship, loves to dance, loves to, to jump around. Uh, she, she's got that ribbon she loves to use, and she's a beautiful worshiper, and I love watching her worship. I can't worship like that. <laughs> I'm too busy going, I look like an idiot. <laughs> People are going to be watching me, and I'm going to look like an idiot, and I'm too busy trying to pay attention to make sure that I'm doing something right. So when I worship, I'm very, very still. The more still I am, the more I'm worshiping God. And I remember one Sunday, one of the, uh, one of the elders of the church there uh, received a word from the Lord. Sometimes they don't get it right. And he got up and he said, Micah, I feel like God is telling me, this is in front of the entire congregation. Micah, I feel like God is telling me that you just need to break out. You just need to let go and just worship God with all your heart. And I'm sitting in the chair going, I, I was until you said my name, <laughs> you know, what, what are you talking about? I found out later what was going on. He was seeing me sitting there perfectly still, assuming I wasn't worshiping. Another time, this was before in, um, in Fredonia, our, uh, the associate pastor of the church was, uh, he was talking, we were all, you know, singing songs and stuff. And finally he said, he said, come on guys, uh, enter into the presence of the Lord. And one of the elders of the church shouted out, I am. <laughs> He said, I am entering the presence of the Lord. And later on, the pastor apologized. He says, you know, I've never even thought about it that way. Because we get so preoccupied with what we see with our eyes, what we hear with our ears. We see what other people are doing, and we make an assumption whether or not they're worshiping. Worship happens in here. It doesn't matter what you do with your flesh. You can worship God crawling around on all fours. You can't do that here because <laughs> we have rules about expressive worship just to keep each other comfortable. But technically, it doesn't matter. As long as you're humble, you have desire and expectations in your heart. Now, can you worship inappropriately physically? Yes, provided that it's with the wrong intentions. For example, um, the individuals, you probably met one that loves to get attention while they worship. And they're doing things to get attention. That person's not worshiping. Well, he's worshiping, but he's not worshiping God. He's worshiping you. But flip that around and look at it this way. When you care more about the person standing next to you and what they think of you than what God thinks of you, now you're worshiping them. I like to, work, I like to raise my hands when I'm, when I'm singing. And for me, it is lifting up glory and praise to the Lord. And if you guys ever pay attention, it usually happens when we're singing songs to God instead of about God. Because I'm connecting with him, and so I raise my hands and worship to the Lord, okay? Now, some of you might think I'm trying to get attention. Trust me, I'm not thinking about you. <laughs> I'm not. I'm sorry, I hope that doesn't offend anybody, but I don't care what you think about me while I'm worshiping, okay? If you're busy thinking about what I'm doing instead of about God, now you're worshiping me. Don't worship me. It's, it's bad. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. We have to, as a congregation, step out of the external into the internal, okay? 
Let's move on. We'll come back to this here in just a minute. Go back to 2 Samuel now. I wonder if I can click that. Oh, that didn't work. Okay. Sorry, last night my computer updated itself, and now it looks different. Gotta love computers. Okay, 2 Samuel chapter 6. Go to verse 16. Let's see how this story ends. Okay, so David's bringing the Ark of the Covenant in the right way, all right? And he's everyone's singing and shouting and dancing. Look at verse 16. But as the Ark of the Lord entered the city of David, Michael, the, the daughter of Saul, looked down from her window. When she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she was filled with contempt for him. The Ark of the Lord was placed inside... Well, let's skip down to verse 20. When David returned home to bless his family, Michael came out to meet him and said in disgust, how glorious the king of Israel looked today. He exposed himself to the servant girls like any indecent person might do. Now, what's she doing? She's judging David's worship. David was worship, worshiping, and she was judging what he was doing. Look at verse 21. David retorted to Michael, I was dancing before the Lord, who chose me above your father and his family. He appointed me as leader of Israel, the people of the Lord. So I am willing to act like a fool in order to show my joy in the Lord. Yes, and I am willing to look even more foolish than this, but I will be held in honor by the girls of whom you have spoken. David got carried away. Uh, we don't we don't know this for sure, but some people have suggested that he took some of his clothes off, and that's what Mikhail was commenting on. I doubt he was actually naked or in a, what we consider inappropriately dressed, but it would be, you know, just a little on the edge. And he's jumping and dancing and leaping for joy and singing. Now keep this in mind: the the, the home of Obed Edom was miles from Jerusalem. This guy had some serious cardio. <laughs> okay, he's dancing and leaping uh, for joy and worshiping the Lord, and he got carried away, and he got judged for it. Was David wrong? No. David wasn't wrong, because he was worshiping God. Who was wrong? Michael was wrong, because she judged what he was doing. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, it says, Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. We are so afraid of worshiping wrong that we refuse to let the joy of the Lord carry us away and we stifle the Holy Spirit. We stifle it. We sit on it. We try to hide it. No tears. No laughter. No shouting. No dancing. Why? Because we don't want to do it wrong. But how do you worship God wrong? In fact, think about this. If you're so concerned about worshiping God wrong, what are you focused on? God or you? Now you're worshiping you. It's so easy. You see why we need a Savior? Sin is really easy. And it's sneaky and tricky. And when it comes to worship, it's so easy for us to step off of the boat into the water and drown. When God wants you to touch Him, or when He wants to touch you, let Him being more concerned about what other people think about what you're worshiping or more concerned about what you think that you're doing is idolatry. Now, I want to warn you about this. God respects the authority He's placed in churches. And the elders of this church have set guidelines for expressive worship. God will not ask you to do something outside of those guidelines because He does not contradict Himself. So if you feel led to start jumping up and down and shouting hallelujah and running around the aisles, that's not God, that's either the devil or your flesh. Probably your flesh. Okay? But if you go to a service where that's okay and God motivates you to do it, do it! Don't sit there and go, what will people think? Who cares? If you care, you're thinking about the wrong thing. Worship is about God, not about other people. Lesson number three. Never refuse to worship out of fear of rejection, whether it be rejection from God, rejection of yourself, or rejection from other people. It doesn't matter. Worship should never be refused out of fear of rejection. I don't want to say this, <laughs> but God made me. In fact, he made me write it down. I was like, well, God, I tell you what, if you motivate me while I'm up there, I'll go ahead and say this part, but I'm just going to leave it out of the notes. And <laughs> He said, excuse me? I'm already motivating you to say it, so write it down. So I wrote it down, and here it is. We here at our Christian Fellowship Church, it's time for us to stop sitting idle. 
but to actively get involved in worshiping God. Let me say it again. I'm going to read it to you in in quotes because I wrote it down in quotations. God spoke and he said, it is time to stop sitting idle, but to actively get involved in worshiping me. God. Now, what do you say? Well, what do you mean sitting idle? Does that mean we have to stand up when we worship? No. What he means is you have to figure out how to get this to worship. You have to. You want to know why? I'll tell you why. You know, I always tell people I don't have an agenda, and I really don't have an agenda, but I do have a plan, and God has shown me the future. And he said, you as a church are going to start doing things like healing the sick, hearing prophecies and have them come true. We're going to start seeing the gifts of the Spirit manifest in this church. Okay? How do we get there? Well, it'd be easy to say, well, let's just start doing them. God told me no. He said, there's a path for you, and I want you to walk it. And it was to start with worship. Why do you think I've been hammering this nail for so long? I'm always beating worship. We got to worship. We got to do this for worship. We got to worship. Worship's like this. I'm always teaching and explaining because I know that it is step one to the end where God wants us to be. Now, I want you to be very careful. If you have in your mind a specific church that you visited or that you've been to that was wild and crazy, that's not what God's talking about. That is not CFC. We're never going to get there, okay? Because that's not who he's called us to be. When I say it's time for us to start worshiping, what I'm saying, it's time for us to get our hearts, our minds, our wills submitted to God. Instead of just coming into church and sitting there and saying, hey, this was a fun time with friends. Good message, pastor. Feels great. But rather come into church with humility, with desire to connect with God, with passion for Him, and with expectations that you'll never be the same. And the same goes for your private walk with the Lord, not just as a church. We need to do this individually as well. Because when we do, we will see the power of God manifest. And you may think, well, that's going to be wild and crazy. No, no, it's not. I was at a church one time. Uh, I didn't see a miracle while I was there, uh, but uh, they were, uh, he, the pastor was referring to several miracles that had taken place within the last, like, month. So these were recent miracles. They sang hymns. Stand up and sit down. It was quiet. I mean, we're far more crazy and wild than they were. You guys are always laughing at jokes and making comments and peanut gallery, and it's great. I love it. You know, this church was very traditional, and yet God was moving in miracles. Why? Because they were traditional? No, because they had figured out how to get this to worship. We need to do that. God has called us as Christian Fellowship Church to be a church of worship. And everything I do as a pastor in trying to to bring us closer to that is not an attack on traditionalism. It's not an attack on the way you were raised. It's not an attack on what's right in the church or what's wrong in the church. It is to get us to understand how worship works so that we can take the first step towards a greater world, a world where we can impact this community. How many of you know someone needs to be saved? Anybody? If you're not raising your hands, you don't know enough people. We all know someone who needs to be saved. You want to know how to get someone to believe that God is real? You say, well, miracles. Eh, That only kind of works. Love. Love. Where does that come from? From the spirit within us, which is strengthened when we worship. I read a great book by a wonderful pastor of a megachurch, and he said, if you want your church to grow, you've got to learn how to worship. Because people will come in and see it real. See, this is real. This church is real. They really connect with God. I want that. But if they come in and see just, eh, you know, we're all just here. We're having fun, but we're just going through the motions. They won't. And people my age and younger could care less about your tradition. They walk in and go, you guys are a bunch of hypocrites. Because they don't see you connecting with God. We have to, as a church, if we're ever going to grow, if we're ever going to get past where we are, if we're ever going to see the miracles and the work and the mighty power of God working in this church, we've got to learn to worship first. We've got to do what David did. We've got to start by learning how to worship. David's attitude towards God was, first of all, to desire and to pursue God's presence, not to take it when it comes but to seek after it. Secondly, never treat time with God as a common thing, but always as a holy thing. When uh, Moses walked in, the the, the bush was burning. What did God say? Take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. What did he say? Oh, God, there's stickers. (laughs) 
He took his shoes off. We need to do the same thing. God says, this is holy ground when you come into my presence. And then lastly, never refuse worship out of fear of rejection. David didn't. He danced like a crazy man in front of all Israel as he walked into Jerusalem. And when somebody called him on it, he didn't get embarrassed. Go, oh my gosh, think about that. No, he said, hey, God chose me to lead these people. I was dancing before God, not these people. I don't care what they think. I care what God thinks. And that's where we need to be. Cindy, would you get ready for that song? I want you to, oh Lord, go ahead and, no, don't stop that. Did you just stop the camera? Okay. I want you to click on the easy worship again, bring it back up, and do the last song. It's number 643 if you want to look at it in your books. Oh, Lord, you're beautiful. I want you guys, while we sing this song, to enter into God's presence with humility, knowing that you are not the end of the universe, with desire to connect with God. I know that it's late, you're tired, you're getting hungry, but your flesh is not as important as your spirit. And it's certainly not as important in God, as God. And then with expectations that while you're there, he will speak to you. He will touch you. He will empower you, strengthen you, heal you, whatever it is. And that you will walk away different. Why don't we sing this song? You guys can stand if you want. You can stay seated. Doesn't make any difference to me. You do what you want. Don't feel pressured by everyone else standing up. You do what you want. Let's sing this song together.